Hello, everybody, and welcome back to 428 Shibuya Scramble. Let's check out how Kano's doing, because I'm pretty sure I got a bad ending for him. Might as well just see. Suddenly a boom as loud as a fire cannon shook the area. What is a fire cannon? What the fuck is wrong with me? It's as loud as cannon fire shook the area. Something's wrong, kind of thought. That's no ordinary city noise. All of black smoke rose among... Rose up from between two nearby buildings. Passerby stopped and stared, gasping in alarm. This was originally a keep out. Then Kano saw flames. This hadn't been an accident. Someone had set off an explosion. The precinct wasn't too far from here. Bioterrorism, an explosion, onlookers. It was a minivan. Someone was inside. That be Hitomi. Charred to ash. Hardly recognizable. Okay, what happened to the keep out then? Huh. Okay, so that still is keep out. Huh, interesting. Alright, well, pretty sure... Now that's sister. Although, I'm pretty sure Maria also available but um uh do i want to see let me see what maria's up to who am i <clears throat> this hasn't gone quiet sitting on a pile of crates seemed lost in thought still i don't dare try to get away all i can do is stand and wait mull of my own situation just who am I? I ask myself again and again. I am. <laughs> I am. I am. I think, therefore, I am. Dama! Dama! I am. Dama? I turn at the sound of an exuberated voice and see Mr. Yanagashita running my way, flailing his arm in a friendly jest's greeting. I swear this guy could wind up banished to the pits of hell and he'd still give it his all, day in and day out. Oh, thank goodness! It is you, Tama! I knew it! The man with the cane grumbles something incoherent, then holsters his gun and flees the scene. Huh? Now you're with s huh? Now you're with some middle-aged guy. You look so sweet and innocent, but I guess you kind of get around, huh? Boss, nice timing. I do a little fist bump. Whatever he's doing here, I'm glad he drove off that guy with the gun. Hmm? Oh, what are you so happy about? Yanagashita gives me a puzzled look, but he's promptly distracted by his own excitement. Oh, well, anyway, never mind that, Dama. He shifts down to a conspiratorial whisper. You know, I'm such an idiot. I can't believe I was such a tizzy over some silly scratch card from a magazine. Until he has news he's itching to tell me. Did something happen? Well, <laughs> He brings a hand to his mouth and giggles unsetting unsettlingly. I had a great little idea. A great way to strike it rich. I feel like I've heard this from you before. Mr. Yanagashita shakes his head fervently. This time it's different. We're talking way more digits than before. Now, try not to be too surprised, yet. Yeah? Spittle flies from his mouth as he rattles on. Or, uh, it's okay to be surprised, actually. In fact, I'm guessing you're definitely going to be amazed this time, Dama. 
I can practically see the bank note dancing in his eyes. Cut to the chase already. What is it you want to tell me? This time, get this. I got a line on 10 million yen. He thrusts his index finger skyward, grinning ear to ear. Surprised now? Yeah, you are. And it doesn't require any capital. It's a no risk high return. In the world of equity investment, a wise investor weighs risk against the potential for return. Many heavily risky projects, however, yield little in the way of actual return. Such cases are called high risk, low return. The inverse low risk, high return is quite rare. The idea of no risk, high return is simply absurd. There's a crazy gleam in his eye. Oh man, I'm finally. Oh man, I'm finally gonna be part of the Billionaires Club! That is so ridiculous, I don't even have a snappy retort for it. Never mind that 10 million obviously wouldn't make him a bear. By the way, you haven't seen Chitty, have you? We're gonna need her help to wrap up that 10 million yen. Chitty? No, I haven't run into her since the sales demo. Oh, God. Well, if you do happen to see her, tell her to get in touch with me. Uh, sure, alright. I still don't know what he's going on about, but there's probably no harm in being helpful. Thank you, Tama. I guess I may as well give you a little hint. Uh, a hint? Yeah, yeah, a hint! Wanna hear it? No, not particularly. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, thanks for helping me out with the security thing. Adios! And then, like a whirlwind, Mr. Yanagashita zooms away, leaving me in the alley. Oof. Suddenly I feel totally exhausted. I let out a sigh and drop my eyes, and that's when I noticed a notebook on the ground at my feet. Did the assassin drop this? I picked it up and looked inside. There's a photograph tucked inside the back cover. It shows three young people, two boys and a girl. Well, what do I do now? Did I go to the police? How would I even explain the situation? I can see it now. There's this killer out there, and he's after this person named Hitomi Osawa. And then the police would be like, Who is that? And who exactly is after her? And then what would I say? Heck, they might not even give me the time of day in the first place. Not only do I not have any idea who Hitomi Osawa is, I know nothing about the guy who's after her, except that he walks with a cane. I mean, I can't even tell them who I am. They'd probably shoo me away without a second thought. What am I supposed to do? I hang my head at a total loss. The necklace around my neck sways idly to and fro. There's her keep out. <laughs> All right, so I keep out. Haven't even touched Osawa yet, but I can unlock uh, Minori Kawa's or Maria's story. I'm gonna do uh, Minori Kawa's. I like Minori Kawa, but he's the person I am the least interested in. I think out of all of the storylines. Oh, all out run. There we go. Minori Kawa. Here we go. It told me, wait! As he ran along Koendori after Miku, Minori Kawa heard someone shout out a familiar name. It told me. It was a pretty common name. Ordinarily, he wouldn't have given it a second thought, but he remembered that one of Miss Midoriyama's winners had, was named Hitomi Osawa. That made him curious. A moment later, he heard a cell phone ringtone. He immediately recognized it as an Aya Kamiki song. His reporter instincts tingled. He stopped to take a look around, and one young woman caught his eye almost immediately. 
He couldn't assume that any pretty girl he saw was Miss Midoriyama. After all, it'd be a little too convenient if he just so happened to run into her now. Still, it didn't cost him anything to ask, are you Hitomi Asawa? Might as well at least check. But to his own surprise, he hesitated in embarrassment. Never been too embarrassed to ask a question before. He didn't get a chance to contemplate that realization. A massive fiery blast knocked him from his feet. A deafening roar set his head throbbing. What, what, what's that? What's going on? Lay in a daze on the ground, trying to wrap his mind about what, around what just happened. Behind him, there was a minivan, fiercely ablaze. A minivan? An explosion? First thing to pop into his mind was the attempted bioterrorist attack on Kasumi Gaseki two years earlier. An unoccupied minivan had exploded outside the MPD station, and afterward, advisement to scatter a dangerous biological agent had been discovered near the subway. In the end, no one had been harmed, but there were rumors that the government had paid a terrorist organization a hefty sum to keep it that way. Right now, Minorikawa was a stone's throw from the Shibuya precinct. Could it be a reseed of the Kasumi Gaseki attack? The entire area was in an uproar. People were running around in a panic. Norikawa could see several injured people lying on the ground unmoving. And yet, despite the gravity of the situation, numerous outlook onlookers were casually taking photos with their cell phones. Norikawa got to his feet, then went to try to get everyone away from the scene of the explosion. Hey, you guys get back! There could be another bomb! Norikawa looked around as he pushed back the crowd. He was getting a strong whiff of a scoop. He needed to write this copy ASAP, but he couldn't just turn his back on this situation now. Two young people were strolling toward the burning vehicle. They had the look of juvenile delinquents. Well, what the heck? Is this for real? Ain't this dangerous? Like, for serious? Pair tried to find an optimal vantage point. Hey! Minori Kawa snapped. Don't get any closer! She put his arms wide to hold them back. The young men came to a halt, but otherwise paid him no heed. Oh, this is bad. This is for real bad. Think this is a terrorist thing? Yo, get out your phone. Come on. But, like, you think this is a terrorist thing? Dude, shut up. Just hurry up and call S Susumu. The taller of the two, dressed in red, was ordering around his blue-clad companion. Huh? The boy in blue huffed. And do it yourself. Say what now? Bitch, this ain't no time to get yourself all worked up. Narikawa stood there, arms still head wide, getting more and more annoyed at their back and forth. You just make the call, man. The young fellow in red scowled. He wasn't going to back down. Huh? Yo, what difference does it make if I do it or you do it? It doesn't make any difference, so it doesn't matter if you do it. Yeah, right. It, it doesn't matter. So in that case, you do it. Look, I'm telling you to just make the damn call. Now I'm telling you to make it your damn self. Oh, enough of this already. Norikawa opened his mouth to tell them off, but then the young man in red spoke again. Dude, the goods from over at Endo Electronics are gone. You gotta let Susumu know. Name Endo Electronics caught Minorikawa's attention. Huh? Yeah, but ain't that all that Achi dude's fault for getting all huffy at us? I mean, it was Kryu, Kiryu, who told us to go find the Endo storehouse. Yeah, but Susumu doesn't like dealing in stolen goods. Says it dirties the SOS name. Well, what a coincidence. Looked like these two were SOS members. Hey, Minori Kawa called out. You two! Finally succeeded in getting their attention. Where's this Susumu fellow? I'd like to talk to him. He had no idea who Susumu was, having only heard the name just now. Still, from the way these two were talking, it seemed clear he was in some position of leadership. You think I'd tell you if I knew? The fellow in red snarled. Norikawa kept his composure. Listen, the guy. You guys know the Teriyu Gumi? Teriyu Gumi was a Yakuza syndicate that operated in Shibuya. An up and coming Yakuza syndicate that turned up on the scene 10 years ago with the seemingly legitimate 
Takarada Financing as its business front. The group offers monetary solutions for people in financial trouble. But those who accept their offering soon find that their troubles only grow and grow. Embroiled in conflict with the Kanto Shinamin Minegumi, who have been long established in Shibuya. The street kids were sure to be familiar with the name, if nothing else. I may not look it, but I'm in pretty tight with the Teriyugumi. And maybe you two don't know, but Susumu's been showing up at our at their office a lot lately. Susumu's been dealing with the Yakuza? Whoa, for real? Sweet! Two punks bought it completely. SOS doing at their hangout these days. Got a little something to discuss with Susumu. Hmm? By now, it's this bar called Inferno. Narikawa made a mental note of the name. Right, Inferno is where exactly? The two men suddenly looked distinctly uncomfortable. Um, uh-oh, later. Yeah, I got a thing to do. I gotta do, too. Backing away, they took off through the crowd. Hey, wait up! I need to know where Inferno is! But the pair had already vanished. Ambulance, ambulances, ambulances, began ambulance, 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 uh, began arriving, <laughs> began arriving at the scene and paramedics rushed to tend to the wounded. Excuse me, would you mind answering a few questions? Oh, when Arikawa turned to see a man in a suit approach him, flashing his badge. So a detective with questions for him, huh? How about you answer a few questions for me? Was this an accident or an attack? We still don't know many details. Let me rephrase that for you. This is a major incident, Minokawa exclaimed. Huh? Detective looked pretty... ...lamoxed. I've been around the block a few times, and I know all your police PR lingo. When you start talking about the details, that is 100% indicative of a major incident. Brushing aside Minokawa's remark, the detective tried another question. Did you happen to notice anything unusual prior to the explosion? Unusual, Narikawa thought back to moments before the minivan blew up. Uh, now that you mention it, I think I heard a cell phone ringtone. Detective tilted his head. A ringtone? Nah, never mind, forget that. There's no way the ringtone on someone's phone would be audible through all that. Narikawa struck the thought from his own mind as he said it. In all likelihood, he dissociated the ringtone and the explosion simply because one had happened right before the other. Gano! A large, statured Caucasian man had called out to the detective. Evidently, the detective's name was Kano. Thank you for your cooperation, he said with a bow. And he ran over to the foreigner. Mr. Minorikawa! Oh, Mr. Minorikawa! Minorikawa turned at a female voice behind him. He found Miku standing there. She looked like she'd been crying. Miku, about earlier, I, uh trailed off, searching for an apology. It's okay, that doesn't matter right now. Miku looked around the scene, when Arikawa followed her gaze. Something big went down here, he said. I know, she exclaimed. The explosion! I saw it happen with my own eyes. You what? Miku looked around nervously. Are you alright? he asked her. You're not hurt, are you? I'm okay. My ears are still ringing a bit, it is all. Good. So what did you see at the time of the explosion? Miku assumed a thoughtful expression. There was this girl who was running toward the minivan. Then I think I saw this other Middle Eastern girl suddenly make a dive for her. And then the van just exploded. Wait, hold on, Minorikawa said. So if I'm getting this right, it sounded like this Middle Eastern girl saved the girl who was running up to the van. Miku nodded. Just then, Minorikawa's phone chimed. He'd received an email. It was from Chiaki. Mr. Mino, are you still working on your copy? Checked his watch. At this point, the four o'clock deadline was barely twenty minutes away. Nonetheless, he decided to stay at the bomb scene. He could definitely smell a scoop here, he was sure of it. Even if he couldn't get his six pages done by four, lending a major scoop would be enough to persuade the loan company. Norikawa jotted his phone number down and handed it to Miku. I'll make things up to you, he said. Give me a call later. Miku took the scrap of paper, puzzled. If you're looking for an Aki Jujitsu Dojo, I know a few. At that, her face lit up. Norikawa decided to process the scene for clues. 
As he wandered around, he caught sight of Detective Kano and his Caucasian colleague heading down an alley. What's that I smell? Something pretty damn fishy. They were slipping away for a private conversation. Maybe there was some way he could listen in. Narikawa hurried into one of the buildings that bordered the alley. Ordered the alley. He looked around and found a public bathroom upstairs on the alley side of the building. Hoping beyond hope, he slipped up to the bathroom window. Voices outside, he held his breath and listened. Those international criminals you mentioned. Kano's words were faint, but he could make them out. Narikawa did a little fist bump. Correct. Roughly eight hours ago. Infected Mario Sawa with the Uwa virus. Then they let her loose somewhere in Shibuya. Hold on. Uwa, you mean... The discussion involved some terms Narikawa wasn't familiar with. He focused all his mental energy on what the two were saying. This is a killer virus with a 100% for mortality rate once it takes hold. 100%? Marikawa muttered to himself. The shock caused him to unclench the fist he didn't realize he made. This wasn't just an interesting conversation. It was monumental. It has an incubation period of 12 hours. In another 4 hours, Maria Osawa will go symptomatic. After that, she'll, she'll begin spreading the virus through the city. It's capable of airborne transmission? If we don't administer Kenji Osawa's antiviral before she develops symptoms, yes? Everyone in Shibuya is going to die. Narikawa felt goosebumps rise all over his body. They were talking about a virus and a Kenji Osawa, they could only mean that Kenji Osawa. He recalled that Osawa... What Osawa had said earlier about the pa power balance of the world being at stake. There was no doubt about it. This was a tremendous scoop. Well then, we need to find Maria Osawa and get the antiviral to her as soon as possible. Just calm down. There's more to the story that... Dot's starting to leak out! It swung open loudly and someone came barging into the bathroom. Fuck off, man! <laughs> ah. It was Yanagashita. Why him again, and why here of all places? Oh, I'm leaking here! Yanagashita was on the verge of hysterics. His voice must have been audible outside. Kano and his companion went to take their discussion elsewhere. And they'd just been getting to the good part. You son of a bitch! Enraged, Minorikawa grabbed Yanagashita and tossed him to the floor. I'm leaking! Shut your mouth! He put all his strength into an ankle hold and gave it a good twist. A professional wrestling technique that involves grabbing the opponent by the ankle. Being caught up like this can be extremely painful. It only puts a lot of... It also puts a lot of pressure on the lower body, and if you're already finding the urge to urinate, well... Ah! Yanagashita wailed. Ah! Norikawa left the idiot blubbering in the bathroom and hurried out of the building. He hadn't heard the whole discussion, but he had a scoop on his hands anyway. This would be a tremendous score for Heaven Publishing. Enough to let the company rebuild. He was certain of it. And if I'm the one saying it, it's gotta be true. As he ran along, Minorikawa tried to plan his next step. First, he had to get back to the editing office. He explained the situation to the people from the loan company. Then he'd go and find that paperwork for Osawa and have Chiaki check his copy. And then after that... Okay, so he still had a lot of things he needed to do. He swatted himself on bo both cheeks to get himself psyched up. His phone rang. It was Chiaki. Mr. Mino, something terrible has happened. Chiaki's voice was a broken yelp. Whoa, calm down. Over on Koendori, this minivan exploded. Ah, yeah, I'm well aware. Thanks to that, I got a big scoop that Chiaki cut him off. Just now. I got a call from Mr. Toyama's daughter, Hana. This time, Minori Kawa waited for her to finish. He had a sinking feeling. She said that Mr. Toyama was in there. It was a suicide. Minori Kawa's knees buckled. Tell me you're joking. No, I mean, the van explosion is all over the news. And Hana was in tears on the phone, and... Mr. Mino? Mr. Mino, are you still there? Toyama had himself? 
Morikawa felt the energy drain from his body. That's certainly a bad ending. Oh! No, never mind! What? What is happening? I got a fucking to be continued. Are you kidding me? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna jump to Kano. Fuck it. Man in a suit. Here we go. Several people were on the ground nearby, evidently injured by the explosion. A girl in a hoodie was crouched among them, doing her best to tend her injuries. Biku Mari Marita, while walking along, upset at Minori Kawa for not introducing her to an Aki Jujitsu Dojo, she happened across the aftermath of a minivan explosion. Unable to stand idly by when faced with such a horrific sheen, she pitched in as best she could to help the wounded. Good for her. Kano recognized her as the girl he'd talked to earlier during the traffic jam. Police, he announced. Get back, let me handle this. The girl was visibly relieved. Help her, she said. She pointed at the figure lying on the sidewalk a short distance from the burning minivan. It was a Middle Eastern girl. She'd appeared to be unconscious. I think she got hurt rescuing another girl, about college age, the girl in the hoodie said. College age girl? That might be Hitomi. What happened to the girl she saved? Kano asked. Good Samaritan looked around. Huh? Where'd she go? The rescuee had disappeared. This girl here, the girl in the hoodie gestured toward the fallen girl. I can't believe how fast she was, she spoke with a hint of awe. The way she moved to get to that other girl, she was on a level way beyond mine. Kano took another look at the injured girl. The figure looked rather delicate. It was hard to believe she was capable of great feats of athleticism. He stared toward her, but Stanley stepped ahead of him. Leave this one to me. His expression was unusually stern, even for himself. Do you know her? Kano asked. The American didn't answer as he checked the girl's pulse and then her pupils. Hey, Stanley. Don't you have other things you should be doing? Stanley snapped. Fine, then. Kano decided to collect some eyewitness accounts. Patrol cars and ambulances arrived at the scene in a steady stream. Once the vehicle fire was under control, things gradually began to calm down. Several officers worked to cover the area around the burning minivan with a blue tarp. Kano got his questioning underway, starting by flashing his badge at a man near the front of the crowd. Excuse me. Would you mind answering a few questions? The man puffed himself up. How about you answer a few questions for me? Was this an accident or an attack? Still don't know many details, Kano admitted. The man shoved his finger in Kano's face. Let me rephrase that for you. This is a major incident. Huh? I've been around the block a few times, and I know all your police P PR lingo. When you start asking about the details, that is 100% indicative of a major incident. Well, I sure picked the wrong guy to try to talk to. Stifling his frustration, Kano continued his questioning. Did you happen to notice anything unusual prior to the explosion? Usual? Now that you mention it, I think I heard a cell phone ringtone. A ringtone? No, no, never mind, forget that. There is no way the ringtone on someone's phone would be audible through all that. The man was probably right, but somehow the idea nagged at Kano. He jotted down a note in his pad. Kano! It was Stanley. Perfect timing. Thank you for your cooperation, Connor told the man. And he hurried on his way. Stanley stepped in close enough to whisper. Who was that guy? Eyewitness to the explosion, apparently. Do you have any info? Said he heard a cell phone ringtone at the time of the explosion. Not sure if that's significant, though. Stanley stood silently for a moment, thinking. What about that girl? Oh, what about that girl? Connor asked. Uh, has she woken up? No. 
going to drive her to the hospital. Huh? Why do that yourself? Just look around, Stanley said. He cast his eye out over the scene. There were so many injured people lying on the roadside. It seemed the authorities hadn't sent enough ambulances. But isn't your car back in Mur Muroyam Macho? Kano asked. Under the circumstances, I think it makes sense for me to go back to it, Stanley replied coolly. Besides, I have a few things I'd like to ask her. Connor was curious. You do? He asked. Stanley's cell rang. Yes, Stanley answered the phone in English. As he listened, his demeanor changed. The blood drained from his face, and his hand began to tremble slightly as it gripped the phone. Kano had never seen him this shaken up. You got it, Stanley said at last. He hung up the phone and let it set and let us sigh. What is it? Kano asked. Stanley headed into an alley without responding. Kano hurried after him. Once they were out of earshot of the crowd, Stanley finally spoke. That call right now was from Gordon. My superior. He broke He broke off there and for a long while was silent. He appeared to be struggling with some strong emotion. Kano decided not to press. If it's that difficult to talk about, you don't have to. No, Stanley said. I should tell you this. He braced himself before continuing. We were contacted on our end by the mastermind of this plot. Was international criminals you mentioned? Correct. Roughly eight hours ago, they infected Maria Osawa with the Uwa virus. Then they let her loose somewhere in Shibuya. Hold on. By Uwa, you mean... Kano thought back to his earlier conversation with Stanley. These criminals were trying to get their hands on a new drug. An antiviral drug developed by Kenji Osawa that had been shown to be effective against the Uwa virus. Stanley hesitated before continuing. This is a killer virus with a 100% mortality rate once it takes hold. Kenji Osawa's antiviral is our only means of combating it. A mortality rate of 100%. It has an incubation period of 12 hours. In another 4 hours, Maria Osawa will go symptomatic. After that, she'll begin spreading the virus throughout the city. It's capable of airborne transmission? Following the onset of symptoms, individuals infected with the Uwa virus bleed from the lungs, and the virus is readily released in the air via coughing. The Uwa virus is highly resilient to the open air and can survive even after saliva or other fluids have evaporated. Simply getting within two meters of a symptomatic patient is said to carry a high risk of infection. Bodily fluids from deceased patients carry an especially high concentration of the virus, and anything contaminated with such fluids must be thoroughly sterilized before it is safe. Stanley nodded. We don't administer Kenji Osawa's antiviral before she develops symptoms. Yes? Kano's voice was trembling now. Stanley spoke with complete certainty. Everyone. Shibuya is going to die. Well, then we need to find Mario Sawa and get the antiviral to her as soon as possible, Kano said, panicking. Stanley remained cool. Just calm down. There's more to the story that... Stanley was interrupted by a strange sound from the upper floors of a nearby building. Unsure of what it was, the two men hurriedly relocated. They paused when they came to a vacant lot. The place was deserted. No need to worry about being overheard here. You said there was more to the story, Kano prompted. The antiviral in question is stored in Kenji Osawa's laboratory. The lab is protected by a sophisticated security system, and apparently the storage area where the drug is kept requires fingerprint authentication from both Osawa and Tanaka. What? But Tanaka's... Kano couldn't help but gasp. Tanaka was currently a fugitive, the prime suspect in the kidnapping case. There was no chance of getting any fingerprint authorization from him at this stage. 
Is there any other way to get in? Kano asked. The door can also be unlocked via password in place of the fingerprint scanner. But we'd still need to know what Tanaka chose for his password. No. In any event, Stanley said, it's essential that we track down and secure Maria. But, he went on, his voice grave. Even if we get Maria to safety, the Mastermind is now in possession of the virus. If they want to, they can unleash a bioterrorist attack on Shibuya at any time. To put it bluntly, the lives of every man, woman, and child in this city are in their hands. Kano felt a pulse of fear deep enough to give him vertigo. He slowly tilted his head, tilted his, tilted his back, his head, and gazed at the sky. Fast and blue as always. There had to be tens of thousands of people in Shibuya right now. Rumi and Shizuo were among them. And they might all be dead within a day. It felt so unreal. Kano's mind almost could process it. With an effort of will, he shook himself out of his daze. Now was no time to waver. We have to try, he said. In the next four hours, we need to find Maria Osawa. Figure out a way to stop this mastermind and the Uwa virus. Words were as much for himself as they were for his companion. Let's do this, Stanley. We might not always see eye to eye, but together, I feel like you and I can find a way. Stanley averted his gaze. My job here is simply to apprehend, Mr. Mind. Kano felt a resurgence of his earlier anger at Stanley. Once again, he was putting his duties above human life. I'm sorry. Stanley's voice was a quiet mutter. You should get away from Shibuya as soon as possible, Kano. Kano hadn't imagined that the American would ever be worried for him. I appreciate the warning, he said. But I'm seeing this through to the end. This isn't the sort of thing you can solve with just an effort of willpower. Even so, giving up isn't the Japanese detective way. Stanley let out a nasal chuckle. Back to that, are we? Same to you. Kano managed a tiny chuckle of his own. Listen, Stanley went on after a moment. This is just between you and me. Mastermind behind this kidnapping case? is an arms dealer who goes by the name of Alfred. Alfred. Beyond simply selling weapons, illegals, illegal arms dealers are also frequently involved in smuggling weapons unlawfully f obtained through deals with government or military contracts. In recent years, such enterprises have become increasingly globalized. Some dealers form smuggling networks that also deal in money laundering, drug trafficking, and more. Alfred? The attempted bioterrorist attack on Kasumi Gaseki, a hotel bombing in Chicago. Alfred had a hand in all of them. What do you know about this criminal? Kano asked. Stanley's expression grew even darker. Alfred's signature is extremely meticulous planning. But I don't mean meticulous in the same way you or I might normally think of it. Their plans are perfectly imperfect. You get what I mean? Anna shook his head. Alfar deliberately engineers accidents to make things complicated and unpredictable. It's difficult to get a good grasp on what's going on when the situation seems to be falling apart. People tend not to consider that coincidental mishaps might be anything but. In the end, they don't even realize they were playing right into the mastermind's hands all along. Kano could hear the intensity in Stanley's voice. I'm afraid that's all I can say. Stanley had out his right hand. See you around, Kano. If we're still alive. If we're still alive. Kano let that sink in for a moment. Nah, I'll shake your hand. After we finish this case. With a slight smile, Stanley withdrew his hand. Then the two bumped fists instead. Alright. We'll meet again, Kano. I'm sure of it. Yeah. See you then.
No sooner had Stanley departed than Kuze's voice came in over the wireless. Attention all units. As of now, further investigation on the kidnapping case is suspended. The director's voice sounded strangely cold. I repeat, as of now, further investigation on the kidnapping case is suspended. Wait, hold on, sir, Kano shouted. What is it, Kano? Could you let us know why? We've received information that Maria Osawa has been infected with an unknown virus. It has been released somewhere in Shibuya. That matched up with what Stanley had said earlier. An anti-bioterrorism security force will probably be deployed in Shibuya. Terrorism involving biological agents such as bacteria or viruses. Biological weapons are easier to acquire and transport than nuclear weapons, and because they rely on an organic natural ability, to proliferate or infect, they can wield powerful results for low effort. For these reasons, recent years have seen widespread apprehension about the possibility of such weapons, but that such weapons might be used by terrorists. In the event that a bioterrorist attack occurred in Japan, temporary quarantine and decontamination facilities would be set up in the area affected. This is no longer a simple kidnapping case. Our part in this is finished. No, it's not! We haven't managed to resolve anything! Gano, I assure you everyone else feels the same as you do. Jose's voice had a cautionary tone. Still performing the autopsy on the body found in the minivan that exploded. I'll let you know once I have a positive ID. Jose, out. Director! Blind had already gone dead. Left at a loss, Kano gazed out at the cityscape. The sight of the Bond vehicle had calmed down briefly, but now that the news networks had begun reporting, the herd of onlookers was growing. There was also a sizable crowd gathered outside of the large home, lo outside of a large home electronics store. The large LCD televisions on display were showing a press conference being held by the governor of Tokyo. Kano's part in this was over. He had to hurry and find Rumi before it was too late. He left the electronics, electronics store and headed for the cafe where Rumi and Shizuo were waiting. Cafe Le Trek seemed quiet when Kano arrived. Shizuo was sitting alone. Kano scanned the establishment but didn't see Rumi anywhere. One of the staff greeted him. Welcome. Just one, sir? No, I'm meeting someone, actually. Of course, sir. The host smiled and then went on their way. Shuzo was glaring at him. Kano walked over to him and bowed deeply. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir. I'm Shinya Kano. You look even more of a knuckle-dragger than I thought. Shizuo maintained an appraising stare. Rumi had something she needed to do, so she stepped away for a while, he said after a long moment. Kano sat down across from him. There was a laptop computer open on the table. Right now, the laptop is in sleep mode, and there's nothing on the monitor, but just before Kano came in, Shizuo was browsing an internet forum. He takes his user handle from the nickname for the apples he grows on his own farm, which are pretty little things, nearly as sweet as honey. I fucking knew it. <laughs> the waitress came by to take Kano's order. He asked for a nice coffee. What are you using that computer for? Kano asked. I'm on the internet. Shizuo's voice was low and gruff. This cafe has an internet connection? May as well start with a little small talk. So what? Again, Shizuo, Shizuo glared at Kano. Gah, I just... The words wouldn't come. No, actually, this is no time to be making idle chit-chat. If they got infected with the virus, Rumi and Shizuo might die. Dumb look. So you need to leave Shibuya right away. Zuo's face contorted with confusion. What are you talking about? Why? Connell wasn't sure if he should tell the truth or not. He was strictly prohibited from discussing a case with anyone outside the department. As a former policeman himself, Shizuo ought to understand fully why the secrecy of an investigation. Well, full... Ought to f understand full well the secrecy of an investigation required. But it wasn't like he'd just up and leave town without a good reason. 
Please listen, Kano said. It's very important that you go, though I... I'm not at liberty to tell you why. Even if this was Rumi's father, Kano couldn't bring himself to leak secret information. His head's... His mind spun with regret. <clears throat> well, I don't need your say-so, Shizuo huffed. I'm sick of this town anyway. Kano was a bit relieved to hear that. Does this have something to do with the case you're working on? Huh? You're telling me to leave Shibuya. Does it have something to do with your case? Yes, Kano admitted. So why don't you run off with Rumi then? Shizuo's tone was frank. Well, I mean... When Kano didn't have an answer handy, Shizuo let out a single heavy sigh. Is your work important to you? He asked. Kano hesitated. Is it more important than... Well, again, Shizuo cut Kano off as he waffled over how to answer. Me? I used to put my work before my family. There was no question in my mind that combating society's ills and solving cases was worth any price. Because of that, I did some pretty reckless things. Almost wound up dead more than once. Jizuo paused, a forlorn look in his eye. My wife did nothing but worry about me. So much that I didn't even realize when she'd worried herself sick. I was so caught up in my work that I wasn't even there for her when she finally passed away. It was all so very absurd to me. Absurd of me. Waitress came by and set Kano's iced coffee on the table. It sat there, untouched, until Shizuo looked at it pointedly. With a tiny nod, Kano brought the cup to his lips. The bitter seat liquid was a balm to his parched throat. I, I told Rumi the same story, Shizuo continued, but I didn't tell her how absurd it was. I told her that her father only did what he had to do. He took a sip from his glass of water. Rumi, she's very much like her mother used to be. Their personalities are almost identical. And I don't want her to suffer the same way my wife did. Shizuo's fist clenched in his lap. What was it that made you become a te detective in the first place, he asked. Well, first I got the job because I thought it would make Rumi happy. And then I guess also because I thought it'd make you like me, sir. It was the truth, but Shizuo simply chuckled. If your goal is to get me to like you, may as well give up now. Sorry, sir, Kano said. I can't do that. Hm. Are you this stubborn around Rumi? Shizuo grumbled. I love your daughter, sir. I want to keep her safe and to make her happy. Why is that? Whenever I think about her, I just feel so amazing. I'm sure that you or anyone can emphasize with that. Everyone has someone they want to protect. It makes them feel that good. It's an admirable thing wanting to be a detective and protect the happiness of the people. That doesn't mean you need to ignore your own happiness in the process. What you say may be true, sir. Earlier today, my partner was stabbed. And today's his wife's birthday. Zuro arched his brow. Is he going to make it? We're not sure yet. Last I knew, he was in critical condition. This is why I keep saying that the life of a detective is... is... Zuo's words trailed off into a lamenting murmur. Even so, Kana was unmoved. Dick dictum number one. Never lose sight of what you're supposed to protect. Ever. It's that. Something that a senior detective I admire very much said. It's the fundamental guiding principle I've stuck to as a detective. But I was wrong about the real meaning behind it. My partner was stabbed. There are people I want to rescue. So much has happened, and now I finally understand what those words mean. When you see someone in trouble, you help them. That's not something a good detective does. That's something a good person does. Kano took a good, long look at Shizuo's face. He had surprised himself, finding the words to speak his feelings so clearly, and he wondered what effect it would have on an older man. I'm sure that, from your perspective, as my future father-in-law, being a detective means that I'm putting my life on the line. That's not entirely true. I can only be myself. This is the kind of person I am. I care about helping people. Even if I were a baker or a brewer, 
or a bookseller, I'd still act the same way. You're being ridiculous. A baker and a detective don't assume anywhere near the same risks. I suppose that's true, Kano fussed with his hair sheepishly. <laughs> Shizuo grumbled. I think I see what kind of man you are now. He sounded oddly defeated. Which is why now is no time to just futz around. Kano sat up straighter at Shizuo's weighty tone. A detective needs more than just passion. A detective can't solve all his problems with sheer determination alone. But at the same time, he needs more than just the ability to coldly assess a situation. He needs the conviction to stick to a case when it might otherwise seem prudent to give up. There was something new in Shizuo's expression now, and a gleam in his eyes that hadn't been there before. Kano almost felt like he was being s sermonized by a senior officer. You got that? You need a cool mind, but a fiery spirit. A detective without both of those is worth nothing. Do you mind if I write that down in my notebook here? Look, Shizuo said, sounding suddenly embarrassed. Aren't you in a hurry? Don't you have to get back to your case? Ah, yes. Sir, please, I need you and your daughter to leave Shibuya right away. Yeah, I hear ya, I hear ya. Kano conjured up Rumi's face in his mind. There was a chance he might never see her again. He forced the thought away as best he could. By the way, if I may ask, Shizuo said. What was it about Rumi that made you fall in love with her? What? Where's this coming from all of a sudden? Was it her looks... No, it wasn't just that. Kana found himself tongue-tied again. I mean, she is pretty cute, and even if this... Oh, I mean, she is pretty cute, even if this is my own daughter I'm talking about. Shizuo shocked him by grinning from ear to ear. Well, yes, she sure is, Kana replied. But it's more than just that. She's also very sweet and kind-hearted. Ah, she is, isn't she? Yeah, she really is. The first time, Kano and Shizuo smiled at one another. You're a man who lets his emotions show in his face, Shizuo said. For a detective, that's... Actually, it's not so bad. Thank you, sir, Kano said. He bowed at Shizuo as he stood up from his seat. Never lose sight of what you're supposed to protect, huh? I like that. Wise words indeed. Kano turned to look back and then bowed deeply to Shizuo. To Shizuo once, one last time. The ability, the ability to coldly assess a situation. Kano knew what he needed to do. There was one thing that was nagging him. No matter how hard he thought about it, it still didn't add up. Why would Tateno let Alkarawan go free? He needed to get back to the precinct and get the truth from Owen. I'll cut on first hand. As he walked along, he considered what he did know about the facts of the case. Just what sort of plan has Alfard put into motion here? It seemed that Tanaka and Osawa held the keys to the understanding, to understanding it. There had been relay handoffs of the phony Itachi case, a relay that Tanaka had been complicit in. Then there was Hitomi missing, carrying the antiviral. Osawa had confirmed that himself. Kano had started to form a vague picture of what Alphard was up to. The Mastermind's goal was to acquire the antiviral, then obtaining the cooperation of Osawa and Tanaka was vital to that plan. After all, their fingerprint verification was required to physically assess the drug. In order to overcome the hurdle, Alphard had presumably managed to win over Tanaka somehow, and had then kidnapped Maria Osawa to provide leverage against her father. No doubt that was how they'd gotten Tomi to take the antibio with her to Hachiko. While the police were distracted by following the Itachi case, Alphad would then take the antibio from Hitomi. That was the general plan as far as, far as Kano could surmise. Just then, a call from Kuze came in over the wireless. We've identified the body inside the blown-up minivan. Kano's hand tingled as it gripped the wireless. Oh. Mamoru Tanaka. 
male, 40 years old, an employee of Okoshi Pharmaceutical. Positive ID was obtained from the subject's personal belongings. What? Kano gasped. If Tanaka was dead, it would now be almost impossible to assess the antiviral drug in the laboratory. The access. At this point, the only antiviral they had any chance of obtaining was whatever Hitomi was carrying. Kano thought back to what Stanley had said earlier. Even if we get Maria to safety, the mastermind is in possession of the Ua virus. If they want to, they can unleash a bioterrorist attack on Shibuya at any time. To put it bluntly, the lives of every man, woman, and child in the city are in their hands. No. Chill ran down Kano's spine. If someone did release the Ua virus, there was no way to stop it from spreading. If Alfar really was planning a bioterror attack, Shibuya would well and truly become a city of the dead. He couldn't help but feel that the whole department was playing right into Alfar's hands. Kano staggered, physically stricken by the realization of just how terrifying a foe they were up against. To be continued. Yep. Ah, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> So did he actually make it to four o'clock? Kano did. Kano. Yep, he actually made it to four o'clock. I can't believe fucking Achi's to be continued is so far up there. All right. Well. Head on in. Let's head on in. What about your sister? Why, she's at 325. <laughs> Eventually, I muster up the energy to start walking around town, heading nowhere in particular. Billboard outside of a department store displays a poster of some female musician. She must be pretty popular because lots of passerby stop to take a good look. Am I just imagining things? I feel like I saw this same poster somewhere very recently. Standing underneath the sign is a woman taking on talking on her cell phone. Sounds like she's having an argument with whoever's on the line. I don't want to be nosy, so I just pass on by. As I come out onto Koendori, I gradually come to a halt. A little tired from all this aimless wandering around, I let my gaze stray along the street as I consider my next move. Then I catch sight of a blue minivan parked across the street. Oh! Suddenly my heart starts pounding. I know this. I know this minivan. If I head over to it, I'm sure I'll remember something. As I pulled by some, as if pulled by some large magnet, I make my way toward the vehicle. As a sudden thunderous boom, I'm knocked flat by a blast of energy, and the world goes all topsy turvy. As I lie in shock, a wave of unfamiliar images fills my mind. A cloud of whirling dust in some place that isn't Japan. A simple room with unfamiliar architecture. A girl. And I know the girl's name. Her name is... On the verge of that revelation, my consciousness fades away. Oh, what? Sudden blast. 
Maria arrived at Koh and Dory just in time to get caught in the minivan explosion. If she's going to avoid this fate, she needs to stay away from that vehicle. Someone else's actions can assure that Hana Toyama crosses paths with her again. Then Maria will talk to her and avoid the minivan. Okay. Okay. So, the, this one. Yeah, wham. Wham! <laughs> Took a quick leap to one side. He managed to avoid crashing into her by taking a tumble himself, but the girl was still definitely a bit shocked. Sorry about that, Achi said. Are you alright? But the girl didn't answer. She didn't meet Achi's eyes. She just looked around as if in a daze. Was she waiting on someone, maybe? Odd girl, Achi thought. Or odd kid, Achi thought. I hope she's okay. What's more, Achi and her tummy set off running. Cool. But now, Maria will wander into Hana. Eventually, I muster up the energy, walk around town. Billboard. Ah! I catch sight of little Hana in front of a billboard, showing something to a woman there, some colorful sheets of paper. The woman looks a lot like the musician in the poster. Moreover, I have the feeling I've seen her someplace before. Wherever could I have seen her? Man, having amnesia is really a pain in the ass. I have no way of knowing whether I've forgotten something or had no memory of it in the first place. The woman looks through the papers Hana held out to her, nodding approvingly at each one. I can hear her murmur with ad admiration. Hana! I wave as I scamper on over to her. As I do, the woman abruptly hurries off. Hey, we meet again, I say. Hana just gives me a bored look. Who was that just now? I asked. I don't know. Hana quickly gathers up her belongings and starts walking briskly away. Oh, hey, wait up, I called out. The girl ignores me. She's moving at a jog now, heading from Spanish Hill to towards Coendori. Ah! Steps out onto Coendori, she falls down hard. The contents of her bag spills out on the road. Oh, whoops. Catching up to her, I gather some of, my fall uh, some of her fallen pages. What's this? There are poems written on the colored paper. Copies of a prose poem called The False Monsoon, or titled The False Monsoon. The poem delicately details the wavering emotions of an adolescent girl. Also, in a clever twist, if the text is read horizontally instead of vertically, it tells about a father's worries over his only daughter, who is now of marriable age. Hana's genius will soon be discovered by Aya Kamiki, and she will be on to become a popular songwriter. A look of embarrassment crosses Hana's face, and she snatches the pages out of her mind, out of my hand. Don't touch those. Those are for sale. Sale? I'm selling poems that I wrote. Oh, wow, that's incredible. She looks surprised by the compliment. Incredible? My friends at school said they were dumb. That's not true. I only saw a little just now, but I thought it was a really good poem. You're just saying that. I've been out here in Shibuya for weeks trying to sell these, but the only person who's bought one was that lady just now. Anna let out a mournful sigh. Well, what are you out here selling poems for anyway? I thought maybe I'd help pay back our debts. Huh? Okay, that's not something I'd expect to hear from a little kid. My dad's in real deep, she continues. Topic makes me think of Mr. Yanagashida. Yesterday is my day for meeting people mired in debt. And I'm only in elementary school, so I can't get a part-time job. Japan's Labor Standards Act prohibits the hiring of children under the age of 15. For certain jobs within the entertainment industry, however, employers can obtain permission from the Labor Standards Inspection Office for younger children to work. I'm impressed. She's so brave. She's maybe a little hard to approach, but she is just a kid after all. 
She's so brave, I just want to give her a hug. Oh, Hana! Oh. Oh, Hana! I hear a strange wailing call from behind me. Startled, I turn around to see Mr. Toyama standing there, tears streaming from his eyes. Uh, Hana! I'm so sorry, I had no idea you were trying so hard to- Toyama rushes up to the girl. It's quite the emotional father-daughter reunion. I- <laughs> Or at least that's how it looks until Hana slaps her father across the face with bundles of papers. What? What was that for? Don't you give me that. Sick of all this running around. She delivers several more well-placed smacks from her little craft project. Okay, okay, Toyama says at last. I know you're upset, but I have to ask you for just one thing. Then we can see about getting through the day, yeah? Okay, but just one. I can't help but find this ordinary interaction kind of charming. You two get along really well, don't you? I say. Yup, nope. Two gave simultaneous contradictory replies. Then ha Hana sullenly starts to walk off, Toyama tultering after her. Twittering after her. It's such a weird little sight that I can't help but laugh. Well, later then. Christ! <laughs> I was so focused on, on her waving. <laughs> I was so focused on her waving. I literally noticed the fucking blue minivan like a fucking millisecond before it exploded because of her waving. <laughs> that... Fucking, I got fucking jump scared by a visual novel. I can't believe, I can't believe this game. Further along Koandori, I came across a car on the roadside that that's spectacularly aflame. A group of onlookers surrounds it in a confused uproar. It seems almost unreal, like I'm looking at a set for a TV show or something. I stand there, staring into the flames. Huh? What's that? I can see something. The raging heat makes the air shimmer. The scent of dry sand fills my nose. A gust of searing wind tugs at my hair. Where? Where am I? Decaying roads. Decaying houses. A decaying city. And the people who live there. People who live. People who live. People who live. There's someone by my side. Someone is with me, watching all of this. It's... it's a girl. The person with me is a girl, slightly younger than me. She says something to me. Anna Isley. Cat's Cradle. That's my voice now. Cat's Cradle? Whose voice was that? What's going on? Who am I talking to? Yeah, cat's cradle. I'm showing someone how to do a cat's cradle with string. But who? Who am I showing how to do a cat's cradle? Kanan. The word Kanan echoes in my head. Kanan? I utter the name aloud. The images floating through my mind are beginning to break up and vanish. But I feel like, for a brief moment at least, I caught hold of the edges of some of my lost memories. 
That's right. Kanan. As soon as I say it, I'm filled with a powerful sense of duty. There's something I'm responsible for. Something that I needed to do. And if I don't, this Kanan person is going to be in grave danger. Calm down. Just calm down. I'm pleading with myself now, fighting the urge to take off running. If I did, where would I go? I have no idea what my destination or my goal even is. Please. Please remember something. Please. Please. I gaze out at the flames, practically praying now. Don't move. A voice hisses in my ear, and I feel something pressed hard at my back. I don't need to turn around to recognize whose voice it is. I thought you said you didn't have any business with... Oh, I thought you said you didn't have any business with... I did a little thinking, says the man with the cane, slowly. About how I might lure out Hitomi Osawa, see? I'm going to use you as bait. To be continued. Rot row. <laughs> We've gotten through everybody's story except Osawa's. So I guess next time it's time to see what Kenji Osawa is up to. Like halfway through the fucking hour, apparently. Everyone is ending early, it looks like. Everyone except Kano. But, yeah. Interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. But yeah, thank you all for watching, especially if you got this far. A lot of revelations, but... Still some confusion. I don't... <laughs> I don't want to say what my theory is yet. I might try to fucking come up with how this might end up ending next episode. I'm not 100% sure, though. But I think I kind of see how this is going to unfold. But yeah, thank you all for watching, especially if you got this far. Stick around, because there's a lot more to come.